Welcome to another edition of Point of Order. I'm your town moderator, Bruce Carlin, and with me again is <laughs> Elaine Lazarus, our town planner. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the uh, planning board uh, articles, the zoning articles. Um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, just again, we'll put this in context. Um, we have a warrant with 62 articles that we're going to be working our way through on May 4th and beyond. Um, the initial uh, articles are, are budget articles, and that was uh, the lion's share of the budget. Then we have some capital improvements articles. And then uh, starting at Article 30-ish, we have uh, 10 or 15 uh, planning board articles and we were hoping to uh, shed some light on them before town meeting so that we could uh, be prepared when town meeting comes. Uh, so which articles are we going to be discussing in, in this session? <laughs> we'll be talking about some zoning articles and um, one of them is um, uh, defining a new use, which what is article? indoor recreation, that's Article 32. And that's uh, indoor recreational use and allowing that in the Industrial B District. And then we'll be talking about Article 37, which is um, the Design Review Board bylaw and sign reviews. And we'll be talking about some modifications to the sign bylaw in Article 38. And Article 39, um, a housekeeping article regarding a special permit language. Um, first off, I've got to say, uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to see this process. You know, the, these are the same issues that come up again and again, and each time we see the planning board refine their responses to these things according to what happens. Can you tell us the process by which these articles come to you? So over the summer, um, the planning board sends out a request for interest in uh, serving on the zoning advisory committee. And it appoints anyone who is interested, including some representatives of various boards, such as the Conservation Commission, Board of Appeals, Planning Board, and also the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And in addition to a number of citizens at large, basically whoever applies is appointed, and it can be a large group. And they have a public forum, the beginning of October, uh, call for any suggestions to changes to the zoning or other bylaws. And then they begin, they list them all on a work program and begin working on them, scheduling them on agendas and discussing each of them. So all of these articles came from, well actually, one of these articles actually didn't come and I'll talk about that, but um, all those articles came from that zoning advisory committee process, uh, either from the public forum or uh, from a staff recommendation or a board recommendation. So in general, we do not see a, an article presented by the planning board that uh, has not originated from either the zoning advisory committee or a petition. That's correct. And in the case where one of these articles was came from another board, an independent process, came to the planning board and the planning board said, go to Zach and then, you know, come back. Um, and that's, that's how that came to be as but, well. So. so the general idea mm -hmm. is bring it to Zach, which is truly open, democratic, you can be on it if you want to put in the time, uh, and uh, we'll work it through on the planning board yeah, side. I think the great thing about the ZAC process is that wide variety of viewpoints, you know, a true slice of the community. Uh, people don't agree with each other, but they discuss things in an open way, and it's, I, I love those meetings. I think they're, they're great. I think so. it's <laughs> the, the essence of democracy. Mm -hmm. So let's start. 32, okay. Article 32. Article 32 came about at the public forum, um, uh, a property owner on uh, Lumber Street uh, in the Industrial B District uh, came and uh, recommended that the ZAC consider allowing indoor recreation in the Industrial B District. So the question was, what is indoor recreation? And one thing that they were particularly interested in was indoor parachuting. Um, <laughs> So that <laughs> I, 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 we don't want the audience mind to, to want what indoor recreation might be, but uh, so so that started the discussion. So that started the discussion about about those kinds <coughs> of uses. So as we've seen in other places, there's indoor soccer, indoor lacrosse facilities, um, indoor 
all kinds of recreation. Isn't there some uh, height limit? <laughs> bowling. <laughs> well, the, the district luckily already has height restrictions. Okay. Uh, but there's, uh, and actually they, they recess apparently the, the fans in the ground, apparently. So we learned. But... <laughs> Oh boy, this, so. this is more interesting. Than, I thought this was some quiet little yeah. article that we could, you know, get over. That's fascinating. So, so <laughs> they brought in a discussion of, of that use, and actually someone who does that for a living came in and talked about indoor parachuting. But then they also talked about bowling and other things that people, over the years, I recall somebody asking 15 years ago uh, about bowling alleys and, and things like that. So these kinds of things have been discussed. And okay. as you know, last year we talked about a hot hockey rink. So those kinds of, of things have been talked about for a long time. So uh, the Zach talked about it. We looked at definitions of indoor recreation that are used in other towns. Um, I looked at the, what kind of facilities they have based on how they define it. So uh, a definition was developed um, that talks about um, allowing it's a facility in a building or structure for sports, athletic or other leisure time activities where everything is entirely within a building. There's no noise generated in there that can be heard outside at the property line. And it does list some possible uses, such as swimming, skating, indoor skydiving, <laughs> uh, soccer, bowling, and similar uses. Um, but there is a caveat that someone cannot have arcades uh, or billiards unless it's accessory to those other uses. So in their discussion of what uses might be appropriate, there was some thought to some uses that might not be appropriate. So there's this definition of indoor recreation that would be developed and it would apply wherever this use is allowed. And what they'd like to do is to allow it by special permit in the industrial B district. So it's not a by right use, it would go through the planning board special permit process. Uh, is it appropriate there? What's the parking like? What's the noise, the lighting, um, traffic generation, those kinds of things. So it would go through a review just to see that it's, it's appropriate in that location. Mm -hmm. And uh, the industrial B district, we have a couple of industrial B districts. Uh, one of them is on the, the west side of Lumber Street between 495 and Lumber Street. One of them is Elmwood Park um, over in this, this area. Uh, another is Yell Harvey and Sons is Industrial B. And also there's a little piece of vacant land on um, Cedar Street uh, that's near the, uh, the town snow dump in, in, that, in that area. So those are the Industrial B uh, areas and a, a portion of the Framingham Sportsman's Club as well. Um, so those are the areas that we'd be looking at where this use would be allowed by special permit. So whenever you have a zoning bylaw, it's, it's about restricting what I can do with my land. And when you ease that up in some way, you're, you're saying, well, how am I easing it up? And you're saying that what, what we've, uh, the added layer that we've got is the special permitting layer right. that says, yeah, you, you can do it, but you know, you, you gotta, you still have to talk to us. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess, you know, I don't think of it as easing it up. I think of it as, um, as time goes on, new uses come up. So when the zoning was originally adopted in 1954, there wasn't much probably in the way of indoor recreation. And, and for instance, a lot of R&D didn't exist. So as time goes on, the town looks at what uses are current, what's coming. So what, you're saying it we, just gives us more flexibility, right, more to, flexibility. To, get, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to get better uses in there more quickly right. so without the restrictions of uh, archaic laws. It's like adding something to the menu of a restaurant. You know, okay. it doesn't stay the same over time. It changes, you add dishes and you take dishes off, so. Okay. So that's, that's the article 32. I think we beat that <laughs> okay. one yeah, down right. pretty well today. <laughs> so article 37 uh, came about uh, because of a discussion that the uh, historic- and, and article 37 is about? Article 37 is about uh, design review board review of signs. Okay. And this came about actually between the design review board and the historic district commission for the downtown talking and they recognize that they conduct redundant reviews uh, of signs. So the Design Review Board is reviewing sign permit applications and so is the Historic District Commission. And they decided that really two reviews aren't necessary and you're forcing applicants to go to two different boards. So because the Historic District Commission has regulatory authority, they approve signs and design review is just advisory, they decided that they would propose a bylaw change so that the Design Review Board does not have to review signs in the historic districts. 
So both in the Woodville Historic District and in the Downtown Historic District, the Design Review Board would not be reviewing those signed permit applications. So they just, it's a one-stop Why would, if, if they have no regulatory authority, why would I bother going to the Design Review Board? What, what happens, what can they do to get in my... <laughs> get in my way if I want to put up a sign. Well, they, they don't get in your way, but they make recommendations to the building inspector. And so through that process of making recommendations, and sometimes they're good recommendations. You know, your, your sign doesn't fit in that area, or, you know, your lighting needs to be adjusted, or your, you know, your colors aren't enough contrast. So some of the suggestions are very helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would say most be, of the suggestions be, are helpful. <laughs> you know, you know I, I was just playing devil's advocate there, but... Um, so in the historic district, the, the historic commission must review your sign. And approve. And must, uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. And for design review, it's advisory, and they make recommendations to the building inspector. Now, does the historic commission generally go back to the design review board and say, would you look at this, or do they... Uh, what's the process? Do We've you know? had a couple uh, where there was an issue because the the uh, application had the wrong dimensions on it, so the person kind of went back and forth. But uh, because there was an error in the in the application, and that kind of raised this issue: is we can just handle this in one board; it doesn't really need to go back back and forth between two. But is there is there some special expertise on the design review board that the historic commission doesn't have that they tap into? No, in fact, they have some members in common, so okay. I think that that helps as well. Okay. So, but they both have you know architects and designers um, on the on okay. the boards. So that's that's the article, and that's the one that came from didn't come through the ZAC process. It came directly from those boards to the planning board, and then uh, ZAC reviewed it after the fact and made a recommendation to the planning board. All right. Okay. So Article 38 uh, are changes to the sign bylaw, and these specifically address lighting. So one of the things that the article would do, so the sign bylaw covers all signs in town, whether temporary or permanent, and this is, these are regarding permanent signs. And uh, one of the changes would um, direct how lights, how signs can be internally lit. So right now we allow um, box signs that have a, just a, a light inside, that would no longer be permitted, but uh, in favor of the individually lit letters, for example. And that signs could be backlit um, and that they could be lit from, from outside. Uh, also, there's a provision um, requiring people to think about the building's architecture when they design signs, that it be conformed to the building's architecture and placed appropriately. Um, uh, is there a restriction there, or is that it's just, just it's, it's, it's a, a suggestion? General, it's, it's a general, general statement. Um, it says that they shall be placed in a line to define and enhance the architectural elements. So in other so words, it's, it's we, we don't outlaw ugly if, no. if that's what the owner wants. No, we do not. <laughs> uh, also, it makes it clear that off-premises signs are not allowed. It was the um, under, one of the underlying... Um, important parts of the sign bylaw, but it doesn't seem to be clear in a lot of, aspe a lot of aspects. So that really makes it clear that off-premises. So if you have a business, say on Main Street, you can't have a sign at Route 495. So your, your sign is on your property. Now one of the good things about the sign bylaw is that there's a special permit provision. If anyone wants anything that's not allowed in the bylaw, they can go to the Board of Appeals for a special permit. You don't need a variance. That was one of the important things we did a few years ago was to eliminate variances for signs because it really didn't make any sense. So a special permit for something that's not allowed. So if somebody really wanted or needed an internally lit box sign, for example, after this bylaw passes, they could apply to the Board of Appeals for a special permit. I want to give directions to my place up on Main Street mm -hmm. from 495. How do I have a sign that says, uh, eat at Bruce's? Uh, well, first you have to have the approval of the landowner where you'd like to put it, and then you can apply to the Board of Appeals for a special permit. Okay. So then that does, that does occur. Okay. Uh, and the other change is um, talking about uh, one of the things that the Design Review Board thought was important was that they, um, there's a restriction on um, uh, uh, wall-mounted signs. Just but. to back up a second on, on that, um, before I, I didn't have the opportunity, before this bylaw, I didn't have the opportunity to do that. That's right. I, I couldn't say, well, I want to, you know, my friend down in the corner there 
wants to put a direction sign to my place. Well, well, actually, that does exist today. You still you can do that today. So uh, it's that, just a different process, right? So that special permit provision is is, is already there. Um, so I'm just saying that once these additional restrictions are adopted, that is a safety valve that's that's in place already okay. that people are using. And one of the other changes. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you okay. on the next one. <laughs> All right. And one of the other changes is that uh, the Design Review Board has uh, seen a lot of signs lately, and one of the things they're asking is that signs on walls are no wider than six inches. Um, there's been, a, I guess, a concern that the sign can be so oh, it's deep. protruding. Right, protruding too far. Yeah. So there would be a six-inch uh, limit on uh, building-mounted signs that are flush with the wall. So those are the, the four changes that are proposed to the, to the sign bylaw this year. Okay. All right. Now we can move on to, okay. to the next right. one. I'm sorry I interrupted the next, you. The next article is just a pure housekeeping article. It's a very lengthy article. It's probably the longest article in the warrant, unfortunately, but it's, it's a housekeeping article. It's all the housekeeping. So <laughs> <laughs> just threw everything so, in there. So well, give us some examples. Okay. So this particular article is all about special permit language. We've talked a lot about special permits lately. Um, and one of the things, when the town first adopted zoning, only the Board of Appeals was issued special permits and there was a bylaw that was adopted that, that talked about that but it was specific to the Board of Appeals. At some point, uh, looks like it might have been in the 1980s, the Planning Board, had, planning board started issuing special permits too and um, they did not adopt a bylaw to go with that. So every time um, the Planning Board was established as the special permit granting authority in the bylaw, there had to be language that talked about issuing special permits and referring to the Mass General Laws section that governs that because there was no central language for that. Okay. So we have all this redundant language in the bylaw that repeats the same chapter 48, so, section so 9 language over and over. It's like going through the Iliad <laughs> and, and hearing the rosy-fingered Don <laughs> every time. So you, you want to remove all those those instances where you, you had to refer back to Mass General Law, now we're going to say, we're going to take it into the town's bylaws mm -hmm. as one simple spot to do it. Right. Here's how you clean up that so language. So there's going to be one special permit bylaw that, that affects both the Planning Board and the, and the Board of Appeals. So it directs everybody to that one bylaw, puts all that... For the language. Right, for that language, puts all that statutory language in one place that both boards are then referred to, and then we can delete all of those other references throughout the bylaw. And so going forward, we'll have the ability to, uh, when we write some new uh, special permit, is it go back to this simplified part in our own charter. That's right. That's right. So it's a lengthy article, but I think it's, it's worth the effort to just really consolidate and coordinate all of that language in one place. What happens if we don't do it? Um, the bylaw just keeps getting longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is just to make your reading, uh, so it's that your you, your sleep is worsened. You can't fall asleep trying to find the spot. <laughs> well, and in for the special applicants, <laughs> for applicants, it will be easier. They'll be able to find everything in one place. It'll be simpler for them it, because I think <clears> now if somebody needs to apply for a special permit from the planning board, particularly, there's a it's a little more effort they have to go through to to figure out what they need to do. So this so is really just cleaning up the language. It's, it's cleaning up the language and it's simplifying it for the applicant. So it's some streamlining involved here. Have, have you had instances where the applicant, the, the applications were off because you, uh, uh, well, you forgot to do that special permit over there or something? Well, I think typically those things are caught in talking with applicants ahead of time, but okay. usually we get the calls, you know, I'm confused. Can you help me with this application? So then you, we go through it with the applicant ahead of time. So um, but it, it would make it a lot easier for them. So it's per application. You got one or two times doing mm -hmm. this every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. you just don't. So so it'll free up. You'll you'll have hours extra <laughs> every day to, to do all your other planning. Right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so let, let's get an overview. Tell us uh, what we've just talked about because you know, my attention span is short. And okay. We'll All go right. back to Article 32. Okay. So for Article 32, we talked about indoor recreation. 
and uh, what that definition of a new use would be and that it would be allowed uh, by special permit in the industrial B district. If at some point in the future other districts look like they might be good places for it, we can go back to town meeting and add those districts. But at this point, it's just the industrial B district in those locations that I mentioned. Um, Article 37 uh, is about the design Re review board and the two historic district commissions with regard to sign reviews, just streamlining that process it. and putting it with one, one entity. Um, the Article 38 is regarding the uh, changes to the sign bylaw, uh, talking about sign lighting. Um, no more flashing lights and, and things, not that we have any, and but it just makes it, makes it clear, protruding signs uh, and interior, interior illuminated signs. And Article 39 is the coordinating the, the special permit language. On those. So those are all, you know, it's a package of streamlining and um, codifying the kinds of things that people have mentioned at the public hearings and public forums that we've had over the last couple of years. Well, this has been a wonderful review. Um, I look forward to having you at town meeting because uh, you explain things beautifully. And uh, I think that uh, Elaine Lazarus, our town planner, is uh, you are a, uh, a gem and it's delightful to have you here uh, in Hopkinton. Um, the um, town meeting is coming up May 4th. And uh, we've got a bunch of planning board articles, and I think you've done an admirable job at navigating us through uh, a, a lot of these uh, issues. And I hope people out there are, are watching and can um, uh, use this before they go to, to town meeting. And uh, it's, it's worth staying for the zoning articles. As you know, sometimes people leave uh, after the, the the financial articles, so yeah. I think it's worth staying for, for the zoning articles. They'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Well, you are. <laughs> In any event, it's, it's good to have you here, and uh, that concludes another edition of Point of Order. I'm your town moderator, Bruce Carlin, and uh, with me has been my guest, Elaine Lazarus, and we hope to see you at town meeting May 4th, 7 o'clock. I'm Cheryl Peralt, co-producer of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, an HCAM series honoring poetry, story, and song that takes place on the third Saturday each month before a live audience. Guest features share their art followed by an open mic with people who come from near and far. Others come to listen and be part of this warm and welcoming studio and to wake up a bit to arts and to life. You're welcome to join us and to tune in or visit our website for our weekly program. Hope you can join us. Hello, I am Marie Smith, and I am the chairperson of the Hopkinton Women's Club Community Register and Telephone Directory. We hope you have found our little book to be a helpful resource in the past. We are beginning work on the 2016 edition, and we need your help. Every household in Hopkinton receives one of these for free, and we want to make sure you are included. Our residential listings are based on the information we get from Verizon. If you have switched to a different provider, such as Comcast, we may not have your number. If you do not have a landline, we definitely won't have your number. Or maybe you prefer your cell number in our directory. So please take a minute and help us make the directory accurate and useful for everybody. Take a look at the Hopkinton phone book that you have and make any corrections in it. Or if you are new to town, please send us an email before June 30th. We would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks to the HEF, HPTA, and 300th Anniversary Committee, we're bringing a program forward to honor alumni of Hopkinton High School. We're looking for nominations and the criteria include graduated from the high school at least 10 years ago, demonstrated a high level of achievement, and made significant contributions to work, home, community, or volunteer efforts, 
and exhibited leadership, character, and service. Please visit our website to participating in nominating your HHS grad. Hi, we are the girls from Girl Scout Troop 72969 from Hopkinton. We would like to thank Mr. Trojan for the awesome tour of the H Camp Studio. If you are interested in fun and adventurous field trips, we recommend one, to join a Girl Scout Troop, and two, visiting H Camp to see how local television is created and produced. We also want to give a shout out to Kalala Supermarket to thank Dale for our Girl Scout Troop tour. And for always giving us a space to set up our cookie booth. Hi, I'm Jen Belisi from Golden Pond Assisted Living in Hopkinton. Staying active is essential to happy and healthy aging. Golden Pond has activities for seniors and people of every age. Different people have different uh, interests and, and different requirements. There is a, a diverse range of opportunities to be had at Golden Pond. I know, I know everybody. I go, go to many activities. I don't like staying. Home. I go to the cooking class on one day a week. They have different seminars um, that we participate in. Well, we do play bingo like many of the other residents. What do you like best about here? The people. They do nice things here. So we've made some friendships, not acquaintances, real, real friendships. If you'd like to participate in any of Golden Pond's upcoming events, visit the events page on Golden Pond's website or call 508 435-1250 for more information. We hope to see you soon. HCAM TV showing movies? That's right. Dive and Drive is a new show on HCAM. Join Mike and I as we present some B movies. Movies that have piqued the two Mike's interest. And not to mention, they're also free. We'll give you some interesting tidbits about the cast and crews and point out some of the reasons these are classic B-films. So check out the HCAM TV website at hcam.tv for movie names and showtimes. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on Edgecam TV.